All right, today is October 17th, 2021, and it is probably about 3 in the morning. Could you tell us your name and date and place of birth? My name is Joshua Adam Dodd. I was born in Dallas, Texas, the year 1991, February 20th. Born in the Methodist Hospital in the Bishop Arts District. And so, um, I know that you're interested. Uh, what what would you say your primary interests are as far as your studies go and your profession? Um, architecture, economics, and finance, and geopolitics. I also so, like history. What kind of history uh, interests you? Well, that's a pretty big umbrella. Um, I like local history, especially with Dallas. And that has a lot to do with the fact that my family has been in Dallas since 1846. We were some of the very first pioneers out here. In fact, you can see our name in uh, certain areas of the city in the form of uh, streets. Like anything named Floyd, it's probably my family. Oh. In fact, Don't the. Did we see those in Richardson? Um. There's a Floyd Street. I don't know if that's the same. But where my, uh, where my family had their land in South Dallas. The city of Dallas has that area listed in a survey called the George Floyd Survey because my great, he was my great, 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 great something grandfather. Um, yes, his name was George Floyd. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> where did they hail from? New York. And they came over here mm -hmm. in like a covered wagon? Pretty much, yeah. They didn't get attacked by anybody? Not that I know of. They survived and didn't get any of those weird diseases, and, and they decided. Well, there, they had a lot of um, throughout the generations. There have been a lot of uh, kids who have died. For instance, my great grandfather's brother Charles, he died from the influenza outbreak when he was um, how old was Charles? He was like twelve years old. He was very young. Um, I know there were some infant deaths over those years. I mean, they were pioneers. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it was harsh. They probably harsh reality. Had, how many kids did they have? Hmm? How many kids did they have? Uh, which ones? Because you have, going down the line, starting from George Floyd, you have um, his son, Charles, Charles Floyd. And then there was Oscar Floyd, and then there was my great grandfather, who was Arthur Tom Floyd, and then my grandmother, Patricia Floyd, and then my dad, and then me. Over that line, that period, there's I I can't really uh, off the top of my head figure out how many kids they had all together. Quite a how, few, quite a few though. How connected do you feel from these ancestors that, you know, perhaps you have met because you were born much after they, they died? Do you feel a sense of connection? I do, because I know about them so well. Uh, my grandfather, he did gene he got really hardcore into genealogy, and uh, he spent a decade doing research and Ge genealogy. That's why we know for a fact that we're descendants of Queen Isabella, King Ferdinand of Spain, um, William the Conqueror, we're descendants of him, um, King Louis the Fourteenth, descendant of him. The Sun King? The Sun King, yeah. We have a pretty big <laughs> family history. 
but we know it really well, and our family history goes back all the way to the American Revolutionary War. Um, with the Floyd side, which is my grandmother's side, uh, George, I believe it was his uncle who was one of the... Um, there's a relation somehow in there. I don't know exactly how the relation is connected, but I know for a fact that there's a relation between uh, George and William Floyd. And William Floyd was one of the first senators of New York State, and he was also one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So I have a direct family connection to the American found the founding of America. Um, on the Dodd side of my family, which would be uh, my grandfather, um, he also did lineage there. We have we also have a connection to the American Revolution in South Carolina. Fourteen of my family members were murdered by the British, and my uh, family fought alongside with the Swamp... I think he was the Swamp Fox, you know who I'm talking about? Um, Mel Gibson's character in the Patriot movie is based off of the Swamp Fox. My family fought with him. So, uh, those characters from that movie, the Patriot, that's my family. So that's pretty, pretty cool to think. So we have that deep of a connection to American history. So I, I do, I take a very deep um, appreciation. Did they have a particular uh, religion? To, to Christian. Any particular sect or denomination? Not really. They were always very independently minded. In fact, my great-grandfather always told my grandmother, he said, you don't you don't have to go to a church to connect with God. He said, just read the Bible if you want to understand it. If you want to you know, connect with God, go outside. That's all you have to do. You don't have to go into a church, join a denomination. I have that mindset too, because I don't like being, um, I, don't, I don't like groupthink. Sectarian stuff. Yeah. Groupthink, um, hierarchy. I mean, there could be I, some sort of rivalries, maybe. Ideological dogma, I guess you could say. I don't like conforming to any ideology. And religion is an ideology, and an ideology is a religion. Again, very independently minded people. I consider myself the same. So what, okay, so uh, rewinding, what part of your family originated, originally came to Dallas in 1843? Uh, the Floyds. The mother's, your maternal side? Uh, that would be my father's mother. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, what made them stop here? Cheap, available land. It was still Peter's colony at oh, that cool. time. Were they part of that, the Peters Colony? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty creepy. Some of the original, um, again, original pioneers. We have letters that George wrote uh, in which he describes the land, the prairies. He, um, he explains the animals that used to be out here. Black bears. There used to be black bears out here. There used to be elk. There used to be... Um, Buffalo, maybe? Buffalo, yeah, there were. He even said that the prairie grass was so tall a grown man could hide in it. I believe that. So. Just take a walk. Um, I'll tell you another, another thing that's interesting. We also have a connection to the Trail of Tears. Because uh, my grandfather, he, um, again, he did all that genealogy research. I'm not too sure who it is in particular, because again, the family tree is quite vast and copious, 
in the directions in which it goes. A lot of people you're talking about. Um, but one of my family members, he, um, he married an Indian woman and they had a child together. And she and his child got lost and caught up in the Trail of Tears. So we have an entire lineage that we don't know what happened to. They're somewhere out there, but we don't know where. That's interesting. And sad. You never know who's your brother. <laughs> you really don't. It's a small world. It really is. How does your family feel about this city these days? Uh, it's not the same. And they're right. Dallas is not the same. It's, um, it's trying too hard to be like in New York and in L.A. all at once. You have all these people moving in. The um, cost of living is now out of control. Um, there's an economic side to that, an aspect which I could go into deep detail about, but that's a rabbit hole that I don't, I don't think you want to be pulled into because, you know, economics, nobody cares about that. <laughs> but it's, um, no, it's not the same city. It's completely different. It's, uh, it's become an aggressive city. It's become a very hostile city. Unfriendly. It's very unfriendly now. It's very dangerous, too. It's like, um, it went from, I mean, Dallas was always kind of a shithole. It's always had its problems, and it, and it has. It's been a city of problems. But um, now it's just, it's like a atmosphere of superficiality. Superficiality. But it's a psychopathic uh, aura, and it's very uncomfortable. I don't like it at all. I really don't like it. I still love Dallas, though. It's I love Dallas. Um, There's some little corners you can still find some happiness in. You, you can still find original Dallas sites, real Dallas sites, and those are the people you want to find. Um, of course, not everyone who's moving here the transplants are bad. You know, there's a lot of good people who are moving here just trying to escape wherever they're coming from because, you know, everyone's struggling to make a living now. It's 2021. Almost, we're almost going into the year 2022. And, you know, it, it, could, it could be worse. It could be like St. Louis. It could be like Detroit or... Um, Ohio, which, uh, you know, very depressing. By the way, my great-grandmother, um, she was from Ohio. She was from Mount Vernon, Ohio. And I mentioned to you that my great-grandparents were involved with bootlegging during the Prohibition era. Well, my great-grandmother, uh, her name was Viola. Uh, her family, they were, I want to, I want to say Mennonites. They were Mennonites in Ohio, but during Prohibition, her uncle was a beer baron, and he would, uh, he would make beer illegally, and all types of alcohol, and distribute it to different cities. And my great grandmother, when she was a teenager, she worked for him. And she and her sister, Peggy, um, she was a mean old lady, Peggy, I remember her, they would ride in a hubmobile, and they would travel to, from his place to Chicago, New York City. They would go to Washington, D.C. They would go all over the place delivering alcohol, and they were making a lot of money. And my great-grandmother, her... Uh, her nickname back then was Blondie. Mm -hmm. Well, my um, her uncle, his name was Colin Hogel, and his nickname was Call. 
Well, he got into a shootout with the police because they, you know, finally figured out what he was doing. In Dallas? No, this was in Mount Vernon, Ohio. Oh, okay. And he, um, he barricaded himself in his house and, again, got into that shootout. And he got shot up pretty bad. When he went to the hospital, where he did die, before he died, he said, I got those bastards, referring to the police. <laughs> And then he died. I'm glad he had a sense of satisfaction. He had a sense of satisfaction, all right. I mean, everyone deserves that on their final moment. So that's, those Maybe are the people I come that. from. So what are some aspects of Dallas that do interest you, that you have a little bit more of a positive take on? Mm. You had talked about maybe uh, the Tesla thing that they're working on? Or? Well, Dallas is an interesting city. It's a transitory city. It shouldn't exist in the first place. Uh, in reality, Fort Worth should be the major city because that's where the railroads went first. But Dallas somehow exploded, which is great. But um, I think Dallas has such a unique personality that makes it fun. As dangerous as it is, it's also fun. And it's adventurous. I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about? I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are some cool places in Dallas. Like here. Yeah. Or Barbara's. It's a matter of who you meet. You never know who you'll meet in Dallas. So just for the record, where do you spend most of your time when you come to Dallas to hang out? Um, Bishop Arts. You like, you like prefer Oak Cliff over this side of the river? I like Oak Cliff. I like downtown too. Um, kind of depends on my mood. I like the Trinity River as well. I like hanging out over there, just looking at the skyline from there, getting pictures that I can reference and draw. I like that. But most importantly, I love downtown because I love skyscrapers. And uh, downtown's got plenty. Yeah, I wonder if they'll ever make any new ones in the CBD. I mean, I know they're expanding outwards. They have two new ones in the planning for the um, east side of downtown. Mm, yeah, the east quarter. Yeah, the, <laughs> the east quarter. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta make it all midtown, east quarter. I guess we are the yeah. next New York. Well, that that's kind of part of that superficiality, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm rolling the, my eyes. That but... The um, superficial developments with all the um, new people coming in and they're like, oh yeah, East Quarter, that sounds impressive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... I have not done one of these interviews in a long time, so I'm sorry. The, my questions are kind of... But if you can think of anything that you want to talk about that's like Dallas history related, what interests you... Uh, memories, recollections of the neighborhood you grew up in, just any sort of memory that pops into your head. Well, let me think. Most of the memories I can think of right on the top of my head would have to be um, walking the railroad tracks, hunting insulators. Because along the railroad tracks, well, 20 years ago, there used to be those old coat poles They used to be strung along them, and they used to be everywhere. You used to see them all over the place, but they're all gone now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I collect those insulators, the glass, some are porcelain, but I collect all of those, and I've amassed about 2,000 of them in my collection. Have you been to Louisiana? Mm, no. Because I have some family that lives in the backwoods, and I wonder if they have got a bunch laying around. They might. 
Because I know there's a lot of abandoned lines. There's a lot of abandoned there. shit over there, and nobody gives a fuck about insulators. I guarantee yeah. you that. So, I... That was some I did. Shit. That was some I did when I was a kid. I enjoyed climbing the telegraph poles. Uh, caused one to snap while I was climbing it one time. And that was fun. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, yeah, there was that. Um, I did a lot of drawing when I was a kid. I hated school. I hated public school. Did not like it. I always wasted my time drawing pictures of cities, skylines, love architecture. Yeah, That's why I love downtown Dallas and the buildings there. And my, uh, my mom's dad, he was an architect in Dallas. So I used to ride around the city with him and he would take me to his job sites. Uh, we would discuss the architecture of the city and everything. Uh, in fact, he went to high school in downtown Dallas in the 1950s. The old Dallas High School? Crozier yeah, Tech. Crozier Tech. That's where he went to high school. And my grandmother, I believe she still has his report card from when he was in, I want to say the 11th grade from Crozier Tech. Was it called that at the time? Mm-hmm. Crozier Tech. It was also in that movie, Robocop. Yeah. That's where the police headquarters mm -hmm. was. Yeah, I love the movie. That was a great movie. So what um, kind of sites did your uh, father work as an architect? But, you know, where did he take you? Uh, just houses, um, commercial buildings. Nothing too big. Um, yeah. Pretty much that, because he enjoyed working on individual houses the most. It's nice. I think he worked for uh, Skidmore, and what is what is Skidmark. that? Skidmark. <laughs> no, no Skidmore, and it starts with an O. I forget the name of the company, but you can you can find it if you look it up. They're they're one of the big companies. Langston and Mitchell. Hmm? But is Langston and Mitchell, it, wasn't that a big company in the early 20s? Skidmore and Owings. I think that's it. Skidmore and Owings. Are there any uh, Dallas-based architects or particular buildings that really speak to you? Like every time you go there you get inspired? or Any architects that are, you, know, you ever think about and kind of wonder what it would have been like to have met them? George Dahl would have been interesting yeah, to have met. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Because <laughs> I like Elm Place. Uh, the one building that I really like, though, in downtown has to be the Trammell Crow building. I love that building. It kind of has an ominous look to it, like a Darth Vader type of uh, appearance. But it's also really beautiful, the way that it's designed. It's, it's, perf it's the perfect touch of modern architecture that still incorporates some skill in design because the new buildings that they're building now they don't really have anything to them architecturally speaking I heard one development described as uh, how did they describe that elegantly shoddy <laughs> Pretty much, but it, it's just this. All that they're building are these glass towers. There's no real design to them. They might have some weird geometric feature, but that's it. And that that's the whole definition of modern architecture. It's very generic, very corporate, very, as you would say, superficial, uninspiring. Not lot even logical. No, it's uh, it's it's all speculative at best. I mean, because I, I saw it as someone's bedroom when I was riding my bike in Deep Ellum, mm -hmm. one of those fancy new apartment buildings, and their bedroom was right there on the sidewalk. I could see everything they were doing in their bed. I was like, for real? Yeah. Who, I mean, and how much money do you think they're paying to have Too everybody much. spy on them? Too much. I don't want people watching me when I sleep. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. 
As much as I love the big skyscrapers in downtown Dallas, I would much rather have the downtown Dallas of the 1940s. Much rather. And the Deep Elm. And the Deep Elm back then. Hell, the, the Deep Elm of 2010 would have been fine for me. <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty fun even back then. Um, it's unfortunate that the tunnel isn't there anymore. I mean, I would drive my bike, run my bike down Elm Street and they're trying to fuck up all those cool old buildings on the left side now. What are they doing to them? Just retrofitting them? Uh, I mean, I know there's like this new dispensary that's in it with all these bright neon lights and super modern looking and it's just all those buildings have the old ghost signs on the wall, the mm -hmm. TMP and they just, they've been there forever and they have like a lot of history as far as the Profit Bar, Dave's Art and Pawn Shop, that was a really cool music gig in the uh, venue in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, there's so much history there and it's... Well, you see, what I like about the old downtown Dallas is how connected it felt. There weren't so many gaps in it, you know, parking lots everywhere. Um, you had beautiful brick and mortar buildings all over the place that dated back to the 1880s. It had that character. millinery shop on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. near the millinery shop mm -hmm. on Elm Street near Deep Ellen. Or uh, near a, a, um, where Kennedy was shot, the Triple F. Like Grassy Knoll. Uh, Dilly Plaza. Dilly Plaza, yeah. <laughs> but that millinery shop's been abandoned forever, and that's one of the oldest buildings still right there on those three main streets. It sucks that we can't have like an old-fashioned millinery shop there and yeah. have, you know, ladies making fucking custom hats. It's unfortunate that um, buildings like uh, the Jefferson Hotel was demolished because that was a pretty cool looking building. Um, let's see, the Texas Bank building, that was demolished. The original library. The original library. Um, <coughs> Victorian. Although it looks pretty ugly by the time they demoed it. It's nice that the old MKT building is still there, but it just looks awkward by itself, surrounded by all those parking lots. It, it's not... It takes away from that connectivity of the city. It makes the city feel vacant and... empty. Um, in defense, to play devil's advocate, uh, James Pratt, that architect that I'm obsessed with, who's passed on, he, you know, revolutionized the city in the 70s by creating freestanding buildings so we could actually have any wind current at all go through the city because yeah. until then it was stifling and all the buildings were straight connected. Yeah. So you'll see that in the older buildings, but then all the buildings from the 70s onwards are all, you know, they allow the currents, the winds to go through the city. So, I mean, there's that, at least. There probably are a little too many parking lots, and they are way too expensive. Do you know why in New York City all the old buildings are built with setbacks? Like when they're going back, rather than in Amsterdam, like they're, you know, where they go they're forward? They're built like uh, steps. Oh, like when you're in a Sesame Street and people are hanging out on their stoops? No, no, no. The um, the stru the actual building itself, like the structure of it, you have a sheer wall that's, say, 15 stories high, and then you have a setback pushed back of another one or two floors, and then above that you have another setback pushed back of maybe two more floors. And throughout New York City, a lot of those old buildings, they're built exactly like that with just a tremendous amount of setbacks. Do you know why that is? It's because the, um, the city of New York, they passed an ordinance a long time ago, like early 1900s, where the, um, the builders, the architects of these buildings, had to design the buildings with setbacks so that sunlight could reach the streets below. Nice. So that was done on purpose. Oh, Th they did build a lot of um, buildings that were sheer height. Like uh, my favorite one is the, equ the Equitable Building in Lower Manhattan. And the Equitable Building, that is an interesting building, interesting history. It has uh, 
the Bankers Club on top of it. That's where the old tycoons of the um, pretty much the Gilded Age went to. The uh, uh, what was it? You had uh, a lot of Wall Street history is in that building. A lot. So what kind of, let's bring it on back to Armletville, so what, what, where do you like to go in Dallas? Is there any particular place that just sets your soul on fire? You like the church, uh, you know, you like to go dancing at the church. Is there any other places that you kind of just feel like a sense of spiritual resolution when you visit? I like to go to the levees. Uh, my sense of spiritual you could call it liberation from the city of Dallas is not a particular location but to drive around Dallas I love just driving around the city seeing all sides of the city I love seeing the city at night I love seeing it during the day but I really love seeing it at night my favorite drive in Dallas is Turtle Creek um, I love driving down that stretch of road because you can see the skyline, how it's grown and how the, uh, the high-rises have encroached upon the Katy Trail over there. And then you can see the growth of the high-rises in the Oakland District, which they're still going up all over the place. Um, a lot of that, of course, speculative developments. But Dallas, uh, in terms of economy, it's, it is a good place to be if you want to find a job. But the problem is, is that, again, um, I kind of consider this economy right now uh, the what I call the post-2008 economy. I kind of call it a bubble, the everything bubble. And again, it, it has to do, to do with uh, monetary policy like quantitative easing and artificially low interest rates and how that's fueled speculative developments and it's created an unsustainable bubble. And unfortunately, when that bubble pops, and the, when that bubble pops, you mark my words, it will be when the Fed increases interest rates. That's when the bubble will pop. Otherwise, if they maintain low interest rates, if they keep that, that's called quantitative easing. When they maintain low interest rates, the bubble will keep building and inflating. Well, price inflation will also keep getting worse and worse. And the main reflection of price inflation from QE has been in housing. That's why housing is so damn expensive. It's a, it's a bubble. Um, the stock market highs, QE, because the companies, they're, ish, they're taking on debt, easy credit, and they're buying back their stocks to increase their stock prices, which is how a lot of these CEOs are making a shit ton of money. It's stock buybacks. So, as you can see, where I'm coming from is that to me, I don't put a lot of faith, and neither do I invest myself into this current economy because I consider it a bubble, a massive bubble. And the moment that they increase interest rates, which is called quantitative tightening, that's when it's all going to crash. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, you the market has to correct itself because these prices are out of control. Unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people who will lose a lot because you're looking at assets deflating by up to 30, maybe even 40 percent. Uh, and the uh, recovery period will take a long time. Um, it's going to be very difficult for our generation in particular to recover from it. Because I, um, I, I actually wrote papers in college about this, explaining how the millennial generation, notwithstanding student loan debt, 
this is essentially we're we're in a depression, a generational depression, an impoverishment. It's that inequality that we've been experiencing, which is why you see all this anger everywhere. That's why, because people are freaking poor. Nobody can afford to make a living, and all the jobs that are out there are shitty, and you're treated like shit by these shitty companies that are just a overworked or overworked, overworked Not for money that doesn't really have any value anymore because, again, price inflation. Because you can't pay afford. So I, I kind of hope that clarifies, paints a picture of my perspective of, you know, the bubble that I kind of see Dallas being part of. It's not a hopeless bubble. Dallas will be okay. We'll be okay. Yeah, there's tons of rich people here. There's a ton of rich people, but, we don't you know, what, go, what goes up has to come down. I mean, we need a city of variety. I don't want to live in L.A. No, I don't want to live in that either. Do you see yourself staying in Dallas or maybe going somewhere else? I mean, DFW. Um, I would love to stay in Dallas. That, ideally, absolutely. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's possible or practical because of how expensive it is in Dallas now. Dallas is ve becoming very, very expensive. And unfortunately, you know, some people, like myself, there's only so much we can afford, which is barely anything at this point. Yeah, you can cover rent, maybe, and then... But, yeah, with your whole check. And then check. eat. Maybe some chicken noodle soup that you bought three years ago. <laughs> yeah, right. That was me yesterday. <laughs> we can put a pause and um, smoke this cigarette if you like. A uh, roll one. All right. What were we gonna talk about? You were talking about the riots, May thirty, May twenty ninth, two thousand twenty. Yeah, last year. Yeah. Um. Yeah, because you had the lockdowns. I was doing Lyft at the time, and I was doing Lyft full time. Throughout, I did it throughout all of 2020. I did it throughout all of 2019. So I kind of saw that interesting buildup that led to the um, the chaos of the of 2020. And um, which, for the record, was set off by the George Floyd not being able to breathe. The lockdowns, all of it. Because uh, for the longest time, I remember, I did all my business at DFW Airport. And I would get rides. I, I was driving a Ford Fusion at the time. A beautiful 2015 black Ford Fusion. I love that car. Rest um, in peace. Unfortunately, it, um, it went through a lot doing Lyft. Because in, in 2019... I had a passenger who I picked up at DFW Airport, and I drove them all the way to Waco. They were a student at Baylor. And on, on my way back, this was around June of 2019, on my way back to Dallas, it was four in the morning, and this is somewhat of a miracle, if you think about it. It's dark, I'm on I-35 near Italy, Texas. It's pitch black on the freeway. You have a few cars here and there, but it's sparse because it's rural, very rural Texas. This is the far outskirts. This isn't even within reach of the Metroplex. This is just the boonies. Yeah. And um, car broke down there before. And what happened was a wild hog jumped over the median of the freeway. A tall barrier, by the way, maybe two four, maybe four feet tall, you know, that thing was big, he was huge, and he had strength, the way he leapt over that, it happened in a flash, I didn't even realize that he had jumped over that, I was driving about 70 miles an hour, I had one hand on my wheel, talking on the cell phone with the other hand, and a bump my car ran right on top of that wild hog. My car went flying a couple of feet in the air and 
somehow, I don't know how, I was able to maintain control with one hand on the wheel while still holding the cell phone in my other hand and then my car landed back on the ground and I thought for a second what the hell was that? Like I, I didn't know what the hell happened and that's when all the lights started shining on my car um, engine light and then the, uh, the light for the transmission and all that and I was like oh shit so I had to pull the car over and the entire undercarriage was completely damaged. I had to have the, um, the radiator replaced and it caused uh, transmission damage that actually lasted until um, I had to replace the entire transmission. It was, it was that bad, the damage that it did. But by the time that um, 2020 approached, I, I had passengers that I was picking up at DFW who were coming in from China. So I was interacting with people coming from China because uh, they were all business people. And in January that year, it was, in fact, I remember the exact date, I came down with something which I could not explain, but it was, I was ill beyond belief. It was January 10th, January 9th, around that time. One day, I was just perfectly healthy, all right, and then suddenly, boom, I can't even get out of, my, out of bed. I feel aches and pains like needles just um, you think it's the stinging COVID? me. I got COVID, yeah. It was so bad that I, uh, at one point, I was so delirious that I would wake up in the middle of the night and I, I didn't even know if I was alive. I would just lay there, kind of awake, but at the same time out of it to the point where I would think to myself, am I dead? Like, it was scary. It was fucking terrifying. And I was uh, coughing up coagulated blobs of blood. When I would cough, my throat was sore beyond belief. I had the weirdest feeling in my stomach that was very uncomfortable, and a lot of the aches and chills. But I didn't. I really didn't know if I was gonna live. It, it was that bad, and I was out of it for about two weeks, bedridden for seven days straight. I um, all I had was BC powder, and when I felt a little better, I went to the hospital. And I said to the um, nurse there, I was like, you know, I don't know what the hell I just came, I, I had. I don't know what the hell that was. So they tested me for the flu, and it came negative. And they're like, well, it came negative for the flu. I said, just um, drink water and take some ibuprofen. You should be okay. Just rest well. You should be okay. Needless to say, yeah, it was COVID. Um, because one of my passengers I picked up around summertime of 2020 when flights started uh, operating again at the FW airport, she, her brother works for the CDC and I was explaining to her my experience and she kind of gasped and she was like, that's COVID, you had COVID. And I thought, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. I even self-quarantined myself in my room for that two weeks period because um, I didn't want anyone getting what I had because I didn't know what I had to begin with. But doing Lyft during the lockdowns was surreal as fuck because I was doing it full time. I was doing Lyft full time and I remember the first night that the lockdown started I was on 183, driving toward Dallas, just south of DFW Airport. Literally, directly south of the south portal of the airport. And it was foggy, nighttime, no cars on the road. I was the only car. And that was so weird, because the only light that you had was coming from those overhead lights. Mm -hmm that are, you know, really high in the sky. 
Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I always the thought they looked lying. like like rings or something. Yeah, they do. Little. They, they kind of look like halos in the sky. And uh, almost like rocket boosters, if you will. But that was surreal. And a lot of the rides that I picked up around Dallas, I had to fish for any ride that I could find. And it extended the time that I spent doing lift from because I was normally doing it eight hours sometimes ten hours I was forced to do it up to 13 hours straight and um, I just had to drive all over the Metroplex literally one um, drive from Dallas all the way to Fort Worth even as far north as Denton just to see if I could find any rides and sometimes I didn't find any it was scary because you also didn't know who you were going to pick up. One of the reasons why I stuck with DFW Airport is because... Um, they've been searched for weapons and shit. Well, you know they've gone through a security checkpoint. Most of them are professional people, and most of them just want to get home. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't want to start trouble. They just want to get home because they've had a long trip. Um, and usually it's a long-distance ride. So you get a lot of money from it, too. Um, I had one ride all the way to Little Rock, Arkansas. Whoa. Yeah. That's so, pretty, uh, that's, how long is that? Nine hours? Uh, it's five hours one way. Oh, okay. So ten hours altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez Louise. How much money did you rack up? I don't know. So. Like 300 Do you only get paid for the one way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can't get paid for mm -hmm. income. That sucks. Nah, that's called dead load. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I did that. And again, it was very surreal, very scary operating during the lockdowns. Um, a lot of the passengers that I did end up picking up, I stayed far. I've al I always stayed away from the bar districts. Even before COVID, I stayed as far away from the bar districts as possible. My uh, my routine, because I like driving at night. When the um, when the arrivals stopped at the airports, which was always around one in the morning, I would go straight to the gym and do a little bit of a workout for about an hour or two. And after three o'clock, I would drive around the northern suburbs to pick up rides to the airport. So there was like a whole system that I developed for it. But my main goal was to avoid the bar districts at all cost. Because uh, not only me, but a lot of the drivers that you'll talk to, it, it's horror stories. The way that they're treated by the clientele mm -hmm. from those bar districts, the entertainment districts, it's horrible. I can vouch for that. I, uh, it, that's one of the things that really um, made me not want to interact with that bar scene in Dallas for the longest time. Because uh, you kind of saw those people. You saw the superficiality of it all, the psychopathic nature of the city. And just the drunks. The drunks. Um, you never know what they're going to do. I hated playing a psychologist for passengers. Cause or they might hurl. Oh, that happened before. Or poop. No poop. That's good. <laughs> no one did that, thank God. Or pissed themselves. Keep it in your God. pants. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, I got to see every side of Dallas. Any every sex? angle. Nudity? Nudity? Like in the, in the car? Like no. Anyone getting freaky? No, um, I had a lot of people hit on me, though. A lot. Um, that, that was awkward. <laughs> quite, a, quite a lot of people. That happened a lot. Um, I had one passenger say to me, I look like Paul Walker, which I thought, well, that's weird, but thank you. He died, right? Oh, yeah, a long time ago. Well, that's not really a compliment. At this point, he was a good-looking guy. I mean, but not anymore. He, he was a good-looking guy. I mean, at the time. I mean, now the he's time. probably dust. Well, yeah, <laughs> bones, ashes to ashes, right? As it goes. I'll tell you one of the most interesting nights, though. 
Dylan left, seeing the really dirty side of Dallas. I had a passenger who was on Harry Hines Boulevard um, near Walnut Road, and he was at a billiards club. The guy was a tourist. It was his first night in Dallas, and I don't know how he heard about this billiards club, but he decided he wanted to go there. And I picked the guy up, and I was like, what are you doing out here, man? This is kind of a seedy area. And he was like, oh no, it, it seems perfectly fine. He told me he was from Charlotte, North Carolina. I was like, yeah, yeah, this is not a good area. And I pointed on the side of the road, those are prostitutes. And you see those guys standing there? Those are their pimps. I said, you can get shot out here, dude. And then I kid you not, as we drove down Harry Hines Boulevard, just within a few blocks, there were, we counted at least 50 prostitutes walking down the road. It was horrible. It was, it was terrible seeing that. Um, but you got to see that side of Dallas, though. You got to see all types of angles of Dallas. Uh, I, I picked up a gang member one night who uh, at Stop 6 in Fort Worth. He, um, he was a former gang member, but he was explaining that lifestyle to me. Um, then I picked up some really interesting people. I, uh, one of my passengers I got at Inwood um, Tavern apparently is one of George Bush's buddies, golf buddies, and he was telling me how he plays, um, how he played golf with Bush all the time. Um, another lady who I picked up in Highland Park was telling me about um, her hairdresser is, uh, what's George Bush's wife's name? Laura. Laura's same hairdresser. So I kind of got to interact with all that, talk to those people. People of all spectrums I got to talk to. Every class, really neat. So it really broadened your horizon. The saddest thing I saw, though, the most heartbreaking thing, was in Fort Worth. This was during the lockdowns, too. I picked up this 18-year-old kid at a bank south of, of Fort Worth, off 35, near where the Budweiser um, facility is. And the kid was dirty. He, um, he explained to me that he's homeless, 18 years old. And he just kind of works odd jobs here and there to try to help his family. Because he has a father and a mother. His mother's in a wheelchair. And he has a little sister. And he was telling me that they were essentially living in a hotel and sometimes in a tent in the woods. And he was telling me about, um, you know, the harsh realities of living, that homelessness, including defending yourself from other crazy people. It was horrible. So I got to see that, too. Um, Did he have money to pay? He had money to pay, but he, uh, it was just really sad to see that. That's probably a crass question. I was just curious. But then, uh, the riots, when the riots happened. Now, I, uh, I picked up a lot of people. Some of the people I picked up were some of the rioters who were going to the riots. One of my passengers I picked up from DFW Airport was uh, a member of the National Guard, and he specifically flew to Dallas for the purpose of patrolling downtown because it was right after the riots. Did he speak much to you? He no. Or she? No. He did not speak very much. Um, he, he was very astute professional. Um, I didn't ask questions. Uh, but when the riots did happen, I, I got stuck in downtown Dallas. I was driving, I exited 35 right there at the horseshoe where it crosses the Trinity. <coughs> There's downtown Dallas. I exited to Cadiz Street 
And as I drove down Cato Street, right under the overpass, the railroad overpass, that's, um, what is that, Lamar? There were the protesters marching down Lamar. And I was like, oh shit, I made a quick turn right there, very narrow road. You know the passage of Cato Street. I had to turn, do a quick turn right there and got the hell out of there. And I drove around downtown Dallas on Riverfront, which I still like to call Industrial Boulevard. Okay. And um, it was insane because you had all these people trying to go into downtown. The police were beginning to barricade the roads, preventing you from going into downtown. And I drove on the north side of downtown, and um, I, 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 I don't remember the name of the road. I think it was Ross. I think it was Ross that was, I was on. But there's a 7-Eleven right here, and I think it's Field Street, the intersection of Ross and Field Street. But right there, on one side, were the rioters. They were fucking angry the absolute anger um, and then you had the riot police on the other side and I drove right between all of them and they were hurling shit toward the police and I w the whole time I was thinking shit how did I get stuck over here and then suddenly I hear on my car thump thump it's getting hit by debris so I got out of there as fast as I could um, and then after that, uh, I got a ride request outside of uh, downtown, so I immediately left and got the hell out of there. Uh, but my my car took some serious damage because that because they actually started throwing shit toward my car, and they were throwing bricks. Mm. They were throwing bricks and all types of shit. It uh, cracked my windshield. It did damage to my side mirror. Um, in fact, the passengers I picked up after that from the airport, I would always point out, yeah, you see that crack? I was from the riots. So, um, and a lot of the passengers, some of them that I picked up, of course, the they didn't experience any of the riots like that. They just saw it on TV. So they were very curious, you know, what that was like. And it was very scary. That's how I would explain it. In fact, Ever since those riots, my comfort level for Dallas has actually diminished a lot. Yeah. I do, I, you, you can still feel there's anger. There's a lot of anger. It's not going away. Um, it's kind of hard for that to go away. Yeah, and they didn't do much to help. <laughs> and, um. I mean, not the rioters, but. Just the whole fucking situation was... The whole situation was a shit show. The whole situation. It was just bad. Um, and then seeing, you know, all the businesses boarded up months on end. Oh, there, there was another, another incident I forgot about completely. When the lockdowns did start, um, this was before the riots, I drove into downtown Dallas. It was midday. Downtown Dallas was empty. There was no one there. The office buildings were empty. The only people that were walking on the streets were all the homeless people. All of downtown Dallas, it was just homeless people walking everywhere. It was fucking weird. And um, this truck in front of me stopped. It was at Main and Hervé Street, right there where the Mercantile Building is. And the light turned red for us. And the truck in front of me, they um, stupidly gave money to one of the beggars. And just like that, four other beggars swarmed that truck begging for money. And I, I watched that and I was like, this looks like something from the apocalypse. This is weird. And of course, seeing downtown Dallas severed by, um, because they had squad cars block blockading all the roads into downtown Dallas for about a week after those riots, and seeing that 
Now that was something quite dystopic. Were you there for the Margaret Hunt Hill day when they trapped him on the bridge? No, no. I, after that, I tried to avoid any any protest, anything like that. Uh, a few times I got stuck on 35 in traffic because the rioters had spread onto the freeway. They, um, they did that a few nights and I got stuck in that traffic waiting for the roads to clear. I, um, I eventually just exited onto Singleton and just did a full loop around the city. And for several months I avoided going to downtown Dallas for a long time. And then when the airport, when service finally started to return at DFW Airport, it was, uh, oh, it was wonderful. It was like, okay, I can finally get back to normal business. Uh, one of the weird things during that time period was seeing all the planes parked on the tarmacs of DFW Airport. I counted on the southern portion of the tarmac about 150 planes parked and they were stationed there for about a month, about a month. That was weird. That was really weird. And then of course, um, when the business finally started back up again at DFW, um, I talked to a lot of the passengers about, you know, like where they come from. All, we, I always had great conversations with my passengers and um, some of them came in from Los Angeles, some of them came in from uh, Seattle, Chicago, and we would talk about, you know, everything going on. And the general consensus that I seemed to get from a lot of people was just this general, um, an, an existential crisis. Like everyone, everyone I talked to, and even people of well means people who have a lot of money because some of the people I picked up were very rich very rich people um, but it was always the same consensus there's something there's something wrong something is uh, happening but they could never explain it of course I would talk um, economics with a lot of them and explain you know like uh, what I explained to you about Huey and all that and uh, I, one of my passengers was actually, he, um, he was in total shock because I was talking about that to him and it turned out he was a quantitative analyst. So he was actually, that was actually his field. And he said to me, I can't believe you actually understand that. It's like, that's blowing my mind. <laughs> but it's good to understand that kind of stuff. So that was my general experience with Lyft. Um, I, I did have a few creepy passengers. Um, I had one. Sorry about that. I had one passenger. I had to kick out. Um, there was another passenger I can remember who, I kind of feel sorry for the guy. He flew in all the way from Seattle, because for a woman here in Dallas that he was madly in love with, but she clearly did not want anything to do with him. I knew something was wrong because he kept sending her text messages and she never responded back to him. And then he kept telling me to change the destination. Then he told me to change the destination to Kroger's so he could get a bouquet of flowers. And I noticed there was a distress in his appearance. And he, uh, he then asked me if I could deliver that bouquet of flowers to his love. I was like, dude, this approach you're taking, number one, is really bad. You've already lost. She doesn't. She clearly doesn't want anything to do with you. Let it fucking go. It's like some Shakespeare shit. Let me just send a messenger to bring yeah. the flowers to the woman. Yeah. I was like, dude. Never ends it, up well. Let it go. The, I, I, like I said to him. I'm not here to make these frivolous deliveries and I don't want any part of this. This is a disaster. And the, the guy had drove, or not drove, but he had flown all the way from Seattle just for this woman. 
who wanted nothing to do with him. Absolute. It's moronic to, to begin with, but... Delusional. Uh, delusional, very delusional. Dangerous, too. Very dangerous, because that kind of delusional, delusional thinking, that kind of um, desperation can lead to some bad decisions. I can put get you in a lot of trouble. But anyhow, yeah, um, there was that. Um, uh, I had a, I had some pretty funny passengers too. Um, I uh, yeah, that's pretty much that with Lyft. I'm gonna just do this. But the reason why I did Lyft, I did it for two and a half years. The reason was so I could subsidize finishing a project, a personal project that I had begun as far back as 2007. And that personal project was a book that I was writing. I used that time with Lyft to subsidize a grace period, if you will, in which I could focus 100% on writing and finishing this book. It took Because it took me in total about 13 years to write that book. And it, it wasn't, um, I didn't just write all of it in that span of 14 years, it evolved. Mm -hmm. I wrote one version and then I wrote another because that version was bad. I had to evolve it with that time period. So that, that was why I did Lyft and I successfully completed that. If you were to travel in a time machine, but you had to travel somewhere in Dallas, what era would you choose? Mm, 30s. Just to see Theater Row. That's all I want to see. <laughs> Theater Row and... The brand new Levy. Well, the Levy was... Yeah, 20, it was brand new back then, wasn't it? So it was, it was built in 28. What? Was it 21 or was it 28? 21. 21? Oh, we can Google it. It was fairly new at the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess it's hard to say because Kessler's plan probably was before 21. Well, they had to move it. They had to move the river because of yeah. flooding. Yeah, divert it. Because you had that flood in 1908. Uh huh. And the so Great they, Flood, so great that they just called it the Great Flood in yeah. 1908. Yeah, I've got a great map in my bedroom of Rock Island before they diverted the river. I think it's funny they had a little island there in the Trinity called Rock Island. Because one of the major railroads that came through Dallas was the Rock Island Railroad. I guess that's probably why they called it that. No, the Rock Island was named... Um, it it got its name from somewhere in Illinois, or Illinois. Anything else you can think of to talk about? No, that's about it. <laughs>